Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Lee Cameron and I'm a Biosecurity Officer with Western Local Land Services. Today we'll be hearing from Phil Sampson about rabbits and Amy Edwards about feral cats. All right, uh, you should see the following control panel on your screen. If you don't, click the orange arrow to display the control panel. This is where you can choose your audio option as well as ask questions. You are in listen only mode, which means you can hear us, but we can't hear you. Today's presentation will be recorded and you'll be sent a link to the recording within 24 hours. We will be answering the questions you have sent through already in your registration form throughout the webinar. If you have any more questions, you can ask questions by typing them into the question box. We will then answer your questions as we go. I will start today's webinar with a quick poll. This helps us to gauge who is joining us today and to check that the program is working correctly. So if you just give me two seconds, we're going to launch this poll. Okay, poll is now open, people. So, our poll, first poll question is, what is your industry role? Are you a livestock producer, mixed farming, broad acre cropping, horticultural or other? All right, we've already got 100% participation in this. So, close. so, the poll's now closed and I'm gonna share the results with you. Okay, so it looks like we've got 50% livestock producers and 50% others. Okay, so our next question is coming up. So, what would you consider to be the worst impact? Worst impact that rabbits have on your land? Soil degradation and erosion? Loss of vegetation or impact on grazing? So we're just going to give people a little bit of time to think about that one. Okay, looks like everybody's voted. So the poll will be now closed and I will share the results with you. So the results are 50% soil degradation and 50% loss of vegetation. Our next question will be, do you consider feral cats to be a problem? So we've got yes, major problem, yes, somewhat a problem, minor problem or no problem. We'll just wait for the few people to vote. Okay, we now have everybody voted. We're closing that and we'll share it with you. And the poll results are 100% minor problem. And our last question for all our participants will be, are you a member of a pest management group? You can be yes, no, or no, I'm about to uh, join or forming a group. So everybody has voted and we'll share those results. And that's 50% yes and 50% no. So we'll hide that. Okay. Okay. All right, so we're up to our Western New South Wales Pest Chat Webinar Series, Episode 2, Rabbits and Cats. I'm now going to hand over to Phil. Phil Sampson, um, following a successful 25-year career in the agricultural chemical industry, Phil formed Jensen's Farm Services with his nephew in 1998 with a focus on ag, forestry and civil contracting plus a specialist engineering and manufacturing operation. 
Both aspects of the business complemented each other with the demand for new and improved equipment needed for the contracting business, which was then marketed to a wider retail market. The presentation showcases the unique approach to developing purpose-built equipment and their success for undertaking some of the largest feral pest and weed control contracts over the past 22 years. Jensen Farm Services is based in Ballarat, Victoria, and supplies equipment at contracting and training to all states. So it is now over to you, Phil. Thanks, Lee, and uh, thanks, Lee, and uh, welcome everybody. I guess the uh, the things we've learned over the last 22 years is that uh, you really can't you really can't uh, rely on um, normal manufacturing to produce equipment that you need. So we've had to set about to do that in order to now produce our own contracting services, but also satisfy a wider market. Um, rabbits are a, a universal problem, we know that, and I won't go into the science behind that. Uh, I wanna discuss just the factors that we go in through with warren destruction being ripping, habitat removal, and I will focus on boxel because we've had some special interest there. Um, baiting using 1080, whether it be uh, oats or carrot, uh, baiting with pin down in more urban situations or closer to uh, where you've got uh, more impact with dogs and so forth. Um, fumigation, uh, and the, the necessity to use a smoker unit. Uh, the impact of biological measures, and we've seen the, the highs and the lows of that uh, in recent times again. Shooting, whether there's a role for that, whether it be contract or whether it be recreational. Exclusion fencing. Um, even ferreting in semi-urban and urban areas is still uh, has a reasonable place. Um, Warren destruction, we specialise in implosion, which is the um, R3 rodinator unit, and I'll discuss that towards the end of my presentation. I've got 20 minutes, um, so we'll go through now and just discuss where we've been involved. Um, I want to focus a bit around the Nimi Kyra project, which was that 88,000 hectare um, site just north of Bell Reynold. We were 12 months on site. Uh, we would go home when it rained and come back. This is just one example of a, of a warren that we were tasked to uh, implode using the um, oxygen LPG unit. Now, the reason it couldn't be ripped was simply that it's, it's an indigenous zone and it was uh, considered to be too sensitive. So that's the sort of job you send, you really shouldn't be tackling with an implosion machine. It's just way too big. There's over 300 openings. So what well, you can rip that is the best solution. And the best solution is to go deep and go with the heaviest equipment you can get on site. And uh, the pest smart guidelines are the best to follow there. But ripping has been, to me, the most economical and most uh, useful solution that we've always had. Habitat removal, we have were tasked at Imikaira to remove over 6,000 acres of scattered boxhorn. We were told three things. We couldn't spray it because Imikaira is an organic zone. We couldn't pull it because of soil disturption. We couldn't spray it. Uh, I mean, we couldn't mulch it. So we were tasked with how do we get rid of it? So we developed this machine you see there. It's called the Enviro Shear. It's attached to a 120 horsepower posi track and uh, it's made from uh, 50 mil bisaloy. When it opens, it uh, clamps on the box saw and cuts it and then applies a 100 mil, up to 100 mil solution of one in 10 of a, um, a water-based graze on. So it was a small enough amount not to impede the organic rating of Nemechira. And you can see the photo on the right is in fact 12 months on. And uh, here we are in 2020, two years on, and there's been no regrowth whatsoever from that treated plant. So that's a really useful tool. It just shows the ingenuity of when you put together four or five different engineers and say, here's the challenge, what can we do with it? So uh, that machine uh, provided a unique solution to a problem. Let's talk about baiting because that's one of my favourite subjects. <laughs> the one on the left would have been uh, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. The one on the right is basically our interpretation of what we needed to do to provide uh, efficient baiting over large scale areas. Uh, some of our contracts have been up to 350 kilometres long, the trail. Uh, average has been 230 and the largest one this year would have been 450, except we had a COVID situation, we couldn't cross the border. So that job went by the wayside. One of the things we needed when we started to look at baiting machines was something that was lightweight enough that you could load onto a trailer or to a ute. Something could be pulled by an ATV because that now started to take over when we started this project from tractors and utes. 
and also something that was durable enough. And um, we've really had a lot of experience with it now. And um, the machine on the left here, and I suppose the same machine, it's done around about uh, 7,000 kilometres now of baiting. So it's sufficient to go from Sydney to Perth and back a couple of times. And I've only had to replace one bearing. So what you need to do is have something that's lightweight but durable, easy to clean and uh, easy to calibrate. And uh, these things are suitable for carrots or oats. Now, what, what you choose in as far as carrots or oats is really dependent on the climate, the storage facilities, the ability to transport. The shot on the left was the Mungo National Park project where we had 240 kilometres of trail to lay and it wasn't practical to try and use carrots so far up that uh, away from Mildura and it was also extremely hot. The project on the right, of course, was the most recent Nimikaira. That was about 250 kilometres and we were able to use two machines, but because it was carrots, we couldn't start work until maybe seven at night. So we had to break that down into 100 kilometre um, runs, 50 kilometres each. So um, the experience we've had is that it really has to be flexible uh, and you need to be able to track your bait laying down to a fine art. What we've done is look at how do we do efficient spraying and so forth in agriculture these days. Well, it's not hard on the likes of these GPS guidance systems. So we've adapted that to go into an RTV. We've also been able to adapt a couple of handheld GPSs. One was to pinpoint the warrens that had been mapped, uh, and the other is to map your distance travelled, so you knew you were about to change, well, top up your bait and so forth, and you could keep track of your calibration. So all of that sort of stuff is available in the marketplace, and it takes the guesswork out. We did some work at Hatter National Park many, many years ago. We developed a precision oat baiter. We never had the GPS equipment in those days, and we really watched ourselves meander all over Hatter without any real um, guideline. What we do now is we ask the customer um, to provide as much warrant information as we can on the site, and then we set our, um, our track up on an AB line. Uh, it might be two kilometres long. Work across from that, we might work 40 metres, 50 metres, 65 metres, and we know that every single run is exactly the same set apart, and that will pick up any warrant in that, in that gap. So it's important to have accuracy. Every time you do a bait program and you just meander off, you will miss so much of the, uh, of the countryside. It's also important to do some monitoring prior. We like to know the volume of rabbits we had out there. The highest I've seen in recent years was 143 per kilometre, and uh, the average has been around about that 30, where baiting becomes absolutely essential. Pindone is a product we use regularly um, in around urban areas. Uh, we're based in Ballarat, and we often do work on the outskirts of Melbourne and so forth. Pindone has its place, but I find most people think it doesn't work because they don't use it properly. And every time I query people, I say, did you free feed? Yes. Did you put the same volume out on the same area four days apart? No. Why not? I didn't realise you had to. So the, the label really is important that that, that build up in the rabbit each time you use it has to be maintained. And if you miss by two or three days, then you've lost that impact. The reason we use pin down, of course, is it's a lot safer because um, we can use it around domestic animals a lot more confident that they're not going to get access to those rabbits during that program. So Pindone has its place, but I find it is much more technical than what it is to use 1080. It's interesting, um, the development of smokers. We have saw the old uh, heavy echo machines back in the 50s and 60s. We were looking for a machine to do a contract job one time at a place called Elmhurst um, on a future wind farm site. It was exceptionally hilly, and um, we asked ourselves, how could we get a machine that weighed less than 10 kilograms? Well, the machine we've got to now actually weighs 9.6, and so it's built, built on the BG56 still blower. We dismantle those and rebuild them from the ground up. The photo on the right's an interesting one. That's the Puckapunyal Army Base in Victoria, and you can see the leopard tanks on top of the hill. They're used for um, uh, siding in different weaponry. The guy on the right here um, is actually looking for uh, unexploded ordnance while we're working. And believe it or not, he found quite a number of unexploded shells and things. So if you think you're uh, dealing with uh, mulga snakes and King Browns is dangerous, try working around unexploded bombs. So we need a fumigation for the reason that 
it's a useful tool where you've got small numbers of burrows or you have, don't have the ability to rip. Um, it's not worthwhile coming in with an, an implosion program. So a smoker is critical. In Victoria, the DPI did a lot of work and they found that without a smoker, the average failure was 90%. So you only had about a 10% outcome because you weren't finding all the outlets and you weren't sealing them. Uh, without a smoker, and you can use the old echoes, you can use whatever you've got, but regardless of how you do it, you must seal every single entrance, not just the entrances, but you must also seal mouse holes, strap door spider holes, um, vents that are coming up through the ground just through dry conditions or vents up through a, a stump or a fence post. And you'll be quite surprised how many times uh, we'll go to a, a field day or a training session and we'll ask people to go ahead and, uh, and seal the warren with their shovels. We ask them if they're happy. Yeah, sure, we're happy. We put the smoker in and we find one, two, three, whatever number of holes haven't been sealed. And that's where your fumigation, that's where your aluminium phosphide escapes. So critical to use a smoker. And um, we use baby oil as opposed to diesel, as I'm sure you'd rather go home smelling like that than you will an old diesel mechanic. But it's a lot more environmentally friendly. The biological measures, I'm, I'm nearly 70, so I can think back to when Mixo was basically a young um, experiment and it worked exceptionally well. We used to have rabbit drives when I was a kid with the cricket club and nothing to go out and get three and 400 pair of a weekend. Mixo still always operates quite well in these colder climates down south. Uh, we do a lot of urban work with our contracting around airports and uh, factories and things where rabbits are a problem from their gardens and other reasons. And um, we've had a couple of outbreaks of Mixo this year, but certainly the original Khaleesi virus was an absolute wonder. I mean, we had 10 years of almost rabbit-free environment. And what we didn't do was take advantage of that and destroy the warrens. Had we destroyed the warrens when there were no rabbits, the recovery time may have been a lot longer than what it was. 